Okay, thank you for the invitation to, to speak at this symposium. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chandrasekhar, for introducing uh, this topic. So um, I'm going to proceed with the radiological approach to, to diagnosing soft tissue lumps, bumps, and sarcoma. Um, so the um, content will um, be based um, around both benign and malignant soft tissue tumours. And I'll talk primarily about ultrasound and MRI. Um, I won't really touch on CT. I think um, uh, the scope of this presentation to even cover this is, is um, some, somewhat um, uh, large for, for the given time. Uh, and then I'll touch on um, ultrasound guided uh, soft tissue lump biopsy. So as we've heard from Mr. Chandrasekhar, there are a variety of causes for a, a soft tissue mass. And there are malignant and benign tumours um, with a somewhat vast list of etiologies. And these top four are the, are the tumours that we really don't want to miss. But then there are loads of these other types of tumours, both benign, uh, inflammatory, or pseudo tumors that kind of muddy the water, and we want to sift out and quickly um, get get to those more important lesions. So soft tissue sarcoma, as we heard, generally are rare. Um, they account for about one percent of all adult cancers, uh, and the true incidence is probably underreported. And it's and it's estimated there are about three thousand cases a year, but by far there are many more non-malignant masses, and these will account for 95% or plus cases of a lump presenting to, to physicians. So as we've heard, there are some criteria that are suspicious for soft tissue sarcoma. Those are size greater than five centimeter, uh, a, a mass that's found deep to fascia, uh, enlarging or rapidly enlarging and painful. Um, but of course, many of these benign tumours will also share one or more of these criteria. So when it comes to imaging, um, it, you, you can't always use MRI to, well, it depends on your resources, but um, uh, uh, doing an MRI for all of these masses is somewhat inefficient uh, and not necessary. So actually you could base your imaging algorithm according to these um, clinical criteria. So you want to try and diagnose as many of these benign lesions using ultrasound, uh, but then pick up the more suspicious or indeterminate ones um, for uh, using ultrasound that you might um, biopsy or even proceed to uh, uh, localized staging using MRI. And then for the larger masses, you, you, you may, may go straight to MRI instead of doing ultrasound. So you want to uh, have a fairly defined uh, algorithm in which um, you, you lead to a speedy diagnosis to the cause of the lump. So both MRI and ultrasound have limitations on the histological specificity, and that's demonstrated by these two cases. So these are fluid sensitive sequences, um, MRI of the thigh, so similar position lesions, um, and the signal intensity of both these lesions are somewhat similar, but actually the, the um, histological types are very different, with one being a malignant type of nerve tumour and the other a benign or a neurofibroma. So the aim of imaging is to characterise the lesion, identify features that suggest malignancy, and, and then help determine the management strategies. Uh, with the aim of avoiding inappropriate surgery and, as we've heard, reduce the incidence of whoops lesions. So ultrasound is an excellent modality and we use it very frequently in our, in our practice, but it is very operator dependent. So general tips are make sure you use a, 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 a probe with a high frequency so you have the resolution. Um, when you evaluate the lump, make sure you're evaluating all soft tissue compartments. And then you can use other tools that the ultrasound are equipped with, such as power Doppler uh, or harmonic in imaging to, to either assess for vascularity or define the boundaries of a lesion. So 
taking this lesion and using using the harmonic imaging setting, you can actually de define the margins a lot better than the actual native uh, um, or the fundamental ultrasound image. And then when lesions are getting somewhat larger, kind of um, eight to 10 centimeters plus, you can, you can utilize a panoramic uh, um, uh, facility to, to, to try and gain an overall size uh, of the lesion. Uh, and of course, ultrasound um, is, is great for soft tissue lesions, but um, uh, on occasion, it's not, it's not as good for defining uh, kind of ossified lesions. And, and on occasion, you'll need to use uh, supplementary uh, imaging modality. So in this case, um, there's a uh, a, a mass which has shown a very well-defined border, um, but behind it, you can't really assess it. And it's only when you actually look at the radiological packet or um, uh, history or even organize a, a radiograph that actually the diagnosis is quite obvious that that superclavicular mass was actually the, the palpable end of a, a clavicular fracture. So again, deep masses, uh, you, you may need to use, um, you may name, sorry, you may need to supplement the ultrasound examination with radiographs or MRI. So in this example of an uh, aggressive looking lesion, you could define the soft tissue elements quite easily on ultrasound uh, with the lesion within the calf, but there's also an element which is um, eroding the bone. Um, and by assessing its vascularity, you could kind of work out that this looks uh, quite aggressive, but but the extent of this bony involvement is quite hard on uh, on ultrasound to assess, and it's only until you, you you do the MRI that you actually appreciate the full extent of the mass, which is occupying both anterior and deep posterior compartments of the of the calf. So the imaging approach um, is similar for both ultrasound and MRI, and. When you're presented with a lesion, we are looking uh, for these various factors and, and the key factors kind of boil down to these. So these are, so you take the location of the lump, the structure of origin of the lump, you're obviously assessing the size, shape, margin and the internal structure of the lump using uh, either ultrasound or MRI. So say if we take um, masses in the groin, so you can just clinically even um, reduce your differential diagnosis to, to a handful of diagnosis uh, and then use other factors on ultrasound that will help you um, um, identify what the cause of the lump is. So in this case of a mass in the groin uh, and the history was two weeks earlier, they'd had a vascular interventional study uh, and they developed a lump. And this, this quite nicely shows this, um, this kind of yin-yang shape, colour flow, Doppler activity at the centre of this echogenic lesion, which, which is a, a false aneurysm. So we could be very specific on the diagnosis of that um, from not only knowing the location, but other features. Uh, another example of a, a, a mass in the groin. So this was um, referred to our unit as a loculated cystic mass. Uh, but actually, when you look at the imaging more closely, you realize that there's a, an echogenic hilum has a uh, vascularity and given its location in the groin this is likely a lymph node in origin uh, and so it was it was um, diagnosed as lymphadenopathy on imaging which obviously has its own differential itself with inflammatory lymphoproliferative or metastatic causes another example of where uh, uh, um, the location is important is important is in, in these cases of um, a mass in the female groin um, so particularly around the inguinal ligament, that the, you can limit your differential um, diagnosis. So in this example, there's a, a very well-defined lesion and it's within the inguinal canal of a female patient. And, and until you assess for vascularity, do you appreciate that there are some very prominent vessels and this was diagnosed as a varicosity of the round ligament. And, and then another such example in the female groin is this a, a very cystic looking lesion on both ultrasound and MRI and given its position and in the female patient is most likely a, a cyst of the canal of nook. So moving on to other features, the so structure of origin is very important as well. So identifying what 
or, or what structure the mass is arising off will help you determine the, the uh, etiology of the lesion. Uh, and these can be kind of, you know, boiled uh, boil down to these structures uh, in, in any given location. So if we take this example of a uh, solid ovoid mass with some cystic areas, it's not until you identify, so this was in the, in the back of the thigh, that, that the sciatic nerve is running into this lesion that you can um, uh, help with the differential diagnosis of a nerve sheath tumor and with these cystic uh, spaces um, was, uh, would, would be consistent with an ancient swan omen. Uh, another example where you, you, you can see these multiple nodules, but uh, until you identify the, that the, those nodules are associated with the plantar fascia, can you actually limit your differential? Because there are very few uh, um, pathologies that will affect the plantar fascia and with plantar fibromas uh, being uh, um, the diagnosis for this case. But when it comes to intramuscular masses, uh, the differential is much wider with both benign and malignant causes. And these are the lesions that you're more likely to, to do further either cross-sectional imaging with MRI or CT or, and or go on to a biopsy to get to the answer. Shape of the lesion is helpful. Um, so in this case, there's a, a very well-defined lesion with this kind of tail going up to the dermis and, and with, the, with, with the other characteristic features will help you diagnose um, spacious cyst on ultrasound. Uh, another example of where the shape is very characteristic is that of a uh, thrombosed pharynx. Here you've got a lobulated um, snake-like uh, lesion into which uh, is continuous with um, a vein not shown um, and this was diagnosed as a thrombosed pharynx just on imaging. Margin of the lesion um, can be smooth or well-defined or ill-defined, and that can happen in both benign and malignant tumors and don't, all, don't often contribute to the final diagnosis. So in these cases, one a malignant, uh, sorry, benign cause and another a, a malignant, um, both of which have very well-defined um, uh, margins. Irregular margins um, can can uh, occur in both benign and malignant lesions. Um, in, this, in this case, this was proven to be a um, case of fibromatosis. It was only after, after biopsy could we uh, um, define that, but the, the margin alone is not gonna tell you that diagnosis. So you can limit your differential, however, but remember both, both benign and malignant lesions can, can have a poorly defined margin. Um, and um, uh, an example of a poorly defined malignant lesion is lymphoma. Here um, on ultrasound, it's very hard to see the, the actual uh, margins to the lesion. There are kind of different echogenic regions, but to, you can't really draw a clear line around it. And even on MRI, these dermal components are very ill-defined and infiltrative, whereas the deep margin is a bit more well-defined. And these are all cases of lymphoma. So the internal structure of a lesion can help uh, pinpoint the diagnosis. And there are uh, a few um, characteristic ultrasound um, features that can help you nail the diagnosis. And one of which is a, a lesion that's anechoic. So that is, it's got no echoes coming from within it, but behind there's posterior acoustic enhancement. And those two features together tell you that this is a, a, a cyst-like lesion. Uh, and, and until you put the Doppler on, will you be able to see that there's no vascularity within it um, and its location was at the wrist and it's very characteristic of a, a ganglion cyst. Um, other diagnoses that we can be fairly specific with with ultrasound are these very heterogeneous lesions actually. Um, but when you scrutinize the imaging, you see various elements. Some are hypochoic, some have these low signal clefts. It has a well-defined margin and that border has this hypoechoic rim. And when you put the uh, Doppler on, you see no vascularity to it at all. And this is all keratogenic debris within uh, a keratocyst or an epidermal inclusion cyst. So there, there are certain diagnoses we can be pretty confident at, at identifying on ultrasound. So 
So the ultrasound analysis of soft tissue masses, as I've said, is a similar uh, process to MRI. So you might say, well, why use ultrasound at all? Well, there's some added value with ultrasound. Um, so me as a sonographer, I can clinically evaluate the, 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 the lump. So I could take the history, do an examination myself, as well as uh, a review and ultrasound. Um, ultrasound is great at identifying calcification um, and it can easily identify vascularity of a lesion and also you can dynamically evaluate um, the lesion uh, using ultrasound and of course ultrasound is cheap and quick. So in this case um, here is an irregular solid subcutaneous mass uh, in the abdominal wall of a female patient. And actually when I speak to the patient, it, they tell me they've had a cesarean and I could see it's in line of a cesarean scar. And um, when you question the patient, it seems to vary with the patient's mens menstrual cycle. And so the diagnosis, the imaging appearance alone is somewhat nonspecific, but taking all those factors together and its location, we could come to uh, a, a quite a specific diagnosis of endometriosis. Calcification, again, so on MRI, um, can be quite hard to identify regions of calcification. So this is a 20-year-old dancer. who have got a painless mass in the um, thigh uh, or groin region. And it's only until uh, an ultrasound is done that you appreciate these regions of calcification. So you get this very bright border on the surface and behind which the, 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 there's shadowing. That tells you there's some dense calcification, and this was diagnosed as mycitis ossificans. But um, of course, uh, be careful with calcification um, as both benign and malignant soft tissue masses can have um, calcification within. So just a, a word of caution with those. Uh, ultrasound is also very good at identifying foreign bodies. Um, so in this uh, example of a lump presenting, um, we can identify a splinter in, in, this, in this lump. Um, and so there's a splinter and this is a, a granuloma that's formed around uh, this foreign body. Um, lesion vascularity, as I said, is easily um, identified on, on um, ultrasound without the need of having to inject any contrast um, into the patient. Um, so there's the dynamical movement aspect of uh, ultrasound that, that gives you the added uh, evaluation. So in this case, um, by palpating, I'm just gonna try and show you this video, but by, by putting pressure on uh, either the lateral side of the foot or even pressing, pressing over the interspace, um, of the uh, forefoot, we could see that there's a very easily compressible um, echogenic lesion with some fluid elements, and that's that's uh, very specific uh, features for an, a compressible intermetatarsal bursitis. Okay, Let's try and move forward. Okay, so when do you, do we MRI? So we'll utilize MRI. Uh, so I might put in CT there as well. So, but primarily we'd go to MRI because you get more information in terms of lesion characteristics from MRI compared to CT. Um, so when, when a lesion is indeterminate on ultrasound, particularly if it's more than three centimeters, would we uh, be more inclined to, to MRI the, the lesion? That or ultrasound shows that lesion is deep to fascia and, and larger than three centimeters. Because um, once the lesion is deep to fascia on ultrasound, it can be somewhat difficult to characterize the internal um, uh, elements of the, of the lesion. And as I've said, intramuscular masses have, has, have a somewhat wide differential diagnosis. That or the ultrasound or clinical ex examination is highly suspicious of sarcoma. You need to use MRI to locally stage. Um, but, but on occasion, we'll, we'll use MRI to, to define or... or or to find the extent of a, a benign large tumor, uh, particularly for surgical planning. So our MRI protocol generally consists of a T1 weighted sequence and um, a fluid sensitive sequence with fat sat saturation. And the axial planes are key with a long axis, either coronal or sagittal, it depends on the position of the tumor itself. And then we routinely don't use gadolinium, but we actually review all these cases 
um, and decide whether gadolinium is required. And the, um, the situations where it is useful is trying to decide whether the lesion has, is solid or cystic. Um, it may be to define the margins of a very infiltrative lesion that can otherwise be quite difficult to see on your standard sequences. It's sometimes useful to, tr to use contrast uh, when there's suspicion of vascular invasion or after um, some local therapy, so post radiotherapy to assess response to, to treatment. So overall imaging um, a lesion, we need to try and decide whether the lesion is benign or malignant or even indeterminate. So there are some features that are uh, suspicious for malignancy and, they, and these are lesions that are big, deep to fascia, um, cross anatomical compartments show uh, heterogeneity with necrosis or internal hemorrhage or highly vascular. These tend to be features that are more suspicious for malignancy, but remember there is a significant overlap in, in these features that um, there are some benign um, processes such as with infection that can have one or more of these features. Um, so bear that in mind when you're looking at these lesions. So when uh, a lesion is deemed suspicious or indeterminate, we, we, are, um, we often undergo, um, will perform a percutaneous ultrasound guided needle biopsy. Uh, most of these done under ultrasound guidance, um, but depending on location um, or the lesion itself, we'll, we'll occasionally do some under CT guided. And, and as has been discussed, you must discuss your um, biopsy procedure with the surgeon who's going to be performing the eventual excision, as you don't want to be crossing uninvolved um, muscle compartments or, or um, anatomical compartments, uh, and you don't want to contaminate any deep compartments. So our procedure would consist of obtaining consent, and the risks and benefits are going to be very specific to, to where the lesion is. Um, uh, so if it's a lesion related to a nerve, then obviously nerve injury is going to be high, um, particularly uh, emphasized. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's going to be very lesion dependent, um, what you say to the patient. But by far, on the whole, benefits outweigh the risks. Um, and um, so the procedure itself is done under sterile precautions. Uh, we perform it in the ultrasound department. We'll use local anaesthetic to numb from skin surface to the edge of the lesion. And we aim to take three to five cores of either 14 or 16 gauge where possible, primarily 14 gauge, um, um, but on occasion we'll, we'll use a 16 gauge needle. Um, and then after you've got your cores, you need to ensure there's hemostasis apply a dressing and give appropriate procedure um, advice to the patient. So our usual um, um, core needle biopsy tool we use is this semi-automated needle. So here you have a, a handle, a plunger, you've got this cutter, uh, cutting cannula on the outer side with some centimeter markings. And within this you have a um, inner stylet, which has a notch, which is where the specimen will sit. So when we um, use ultrasound, we'll, we'll guide the needle in, we'll then press the plunger to, to bring out the inner stylet and make sure that's located within the lesion itself, but also observing the tip itself to make sure it's not contaminating any deeper compartments. And then with further pressure, we're able to, um, there's, a, there's a kind of spring-loaded mechanism which fires the cutting needle over the inner stylet. Uh, and so retrieving um, uh, the sample in this specimen notch. So you could perform these uh, using a coaxial or non-coaxial technique. And we tend to use 14 gauge most of the time with a two centimetre throw. But on occasion, it may need to use a 16 gauge. Uh, and I find a 16 gauge is particularly good for, for a very hard lesion as the smaller needle is more likely to cut through it rather than a 14 gauge. So the actual approach um, you, you need to plan with your surgeon and is also very dependent on the lesion and the compartments in, involved. And it's a discussion between uh, your surgeon whether you decide to go longitudinal or transverse uh, and both of them have each of their uh, advantages. <clears throat> 
Um, and your main aim is to ensure you stay within the track, within the field that's going to be excised. Um, so we've reviewed our um, practice of percutaneous core needle biopsy over a seven year period. And we found that we will reach a diagnosis 95, 96% of the time uh, with only a very small portion of inconclusive um, results. And those inconclusive um, uh, um, specimens can kind of be grouped into to these main categories. Either the lesion is very challenging to access, um, or there's been insufficient sampling, uh, or tissue heterogeneity, so tissue with large necrotic components. Um, so, so really, overall, we're getting um, a large proportion of our uh, um, percutaneous uh, biopsy with, uh, will, will result in an answer. Uh, and I've outlined a few tips there. So in summary, um, ultrasound and MRI are both useful in the assessment of soft tissue masses. Um, I've not discussed CT, um, but CT we reserve it for very limited cases, and they tend to be patients who, who haven't been able to undergo an MRI for a variety of reasons. Um, and because there's limited um, soft tissue characterization, uh, it needs to be used with caution. Um, so differentiating, and as, as I've said, differentiating benign from malignant can be difficult with both imaging modalities, uh, and imaging plays quite a key role in the management algorithms. And as I've outlined, ultrasound guided biopsy um, of indeterminate or suspected malignant peripheral soft tissue masses is a quick, easy and safe procedure and will often result in a histological diagnosis. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge Dr. Rob Campbell as um, some of these cases and slides uh, have been provided by him. So I'm going to hand back to, to Hitesh. I'll just stop my share.